Okay. Cool. Um, the right button here. So my name is Robert Hyam. I am a senior cybersecurity researcher. Um, I have a master's in cyber intelligence from the University of South Florida. And the only reason I bring that up, and I'm gonna I'm gonna throw up my um, sign, but don't be scared. We're playing Houston soon, and this isn't uh, hook 'em horns. This is go bulls. So you have nothing to worry about. Um, I, I'm I guess I'm getting to be known as somewhat of a, a gray beard at this point in uh, cybersecurity. I, I, it hurt me to put that number up there on the slide, but. Um, I do some, I put some stuff out on LinkedIn, but my um, Twitter is desperately needing some followers. So if you don't, if you like the talk and um, I am going to, I ran out of time. I tested this uh, this morning and I did only got halfway through it in like 40 minutes. So um, yeah, I'm going to have to go through pretty quickly. I promise I'll record the full um, description of one of the, a couple of the slides I'm going to have to skip through pretty quickly, but. Anyway, um, so why am I here today? I think this uh, quote from Alice in Wonderland kind of sums it up. Um, I, you know, I think there's a couple different messages here. One, threat hunting is, you know, a destination. It's something, it's somewhere you're trying to go, right? Um, and the way to get there is to, first, of, first off, just go, right? Get, get to walking, right? You're going to get somewhere if, if you walk long enough. Um, I've gone down a lot of different roads, and a lot of them I ended up with figuring out that wasn't the way to do what, what I was trying to do. And um, I'm still learning, but um, I've built a, uh, a, a threat hunting program at a Fortune 50 company. I then toured some socks, helping other people do it. I created a workshop, teaching people how to do it, and delivered that all over the place. And then um, I built a service around threat hunting for SecureWorks. So I've, been, I've, I've got both sides of the coin. I've built it for my own company or for a company. I don't own a Fortune 50 company. But, uh, and I've also built it to service customers. So um, like I said, still a lot, of, lot to learn. But um, what I'm here is to kind of share with you my experiences doing that and uh, some of the lessons learned. Um, so really, section one, uh, the, the title of the threat hunt, or the title of the presentation is what threat hunting is and isn't, but that's really just the first section. And actually, I'm, that's one of the sections that I'm just going to breeze through really quickly. There's a ton of content out uh, about what threat hunting is, definitions of threat hunting, and they're all pretty close. Um, so we'll, we'll breeze through that. I want to focus mostly on um, where I've been and the kind of lessons I've learned and maybe hopefully help you avoid some of the missteps that I've had. Uh, then we're gonna talk about where hunting fits in a security operations program. And if you decide that you do wanna partner with somebody, what that kind of looks like. Um, and then hopefully we have some time and I'll run through some example threat hunts that I like, that, that I think are, are fruitful and um, I've have, I have some personal experience with. But first I need a, a public service announcement. announcement. There's this recent trend of this awful term called thrunting going all over social media. Um, if we work together, we can stop this uh, neologism, which I currently uh, recently learned as a word, uh, coined a, a new term. We can stop it before it happens. I like the meme. Um, read, uh, you guys can read the top. I didn't know how big this was going to be, but yeah, he's, I agree with him. He says the fact that he has to make this meme is why he's, he day drinks. Um, so all kidding aside, what threat hunting is and isn't. There's a lot of definitions out there for what threat hunting is. This is ours. Um, most have the same language in them. It's proactive, it's iterative. You're looking for uh, current or historical threats that are evading your existing uh, security, right? And then I highlighted this part is missing from most of the definitions that I see, and that is um, don't waste what you did. It, it, you need to use what you learned to improve your cyber resilience. And cyber resilience is just your ability to maintain uh, we're always under constant attack, right? Um, do your ability to maintain your, uh, whatever it is you do for a business, making widgets, selling it, selling cars, selling insurance, um, providing healthcare, um, your ability to continue to do that, even though we know that we're opening ports and people are trying to um, get in our networks constantly, right? Um, so a brief history of threat hunting. 
So the first term, the first, uh, the first occurrence of the word hunter in any meaningful way as it applies to cybersecurity was in an uh, InfoSec magazine, information security magazine around 2011. Uh, it's not, I, I was surprised to find that the modern SOC is really not much um, older than that, the, the early 2000, 2005. So we, we, you'll see a lot of people say hunting is not, or uh, that hunting is relatively new, but relative to what? Because it's, it's, it's um, 2000, like I said, 2000 SOC, uh, 2011 threat hunting. But then the next kind of major event as I see it is David Bianco's Pyramid of Pain. If you're not familiar with it, um, it's definitely worth taking a look at. It really describes how to cause the most pain on your adversary. And it says indicators of compromise are not a uh, signature-based um, rules, looking for things like indicators of compromise, file hashes, file names, IP addresses. Those are so easily changed that they're not really keeping the adversaries out of the network for as long as we'd like to. And um, the reason why it pairs so well with threat hunting is because threat hunting is really focused on those behavioral, looking at what you expect to happen on your network by your users, and then looking for deviations from those patterns, really. Um, threat hunting is, uh, it, I'm making it sound like it, it's very advanced, but you, you kind of work your way up there. But that's really what it, that's why the Pyramid of Pain um, goes so well with threat hunting, because it kind of describes, we're, we're trying to strive for longer term solutions, which really only if you know your own network or somebody you work with, somebody who has knowledge of your network, can you can't really um, you can't really identify the behaviors that are potentially malicious that deviate from the behaviors of what you're what you expect to see from your own um, users of your network. And then um, the first, apparently my uh, anyway, the, uh, around 2016, the threat hunting had been part of digital forensics threat intelligence conversations, things like that prior, but this was the first time SANS offered a dedicated summit for it with the threat hunting in the name, and they've had that uh, every year um, since. And then in 2017, SANS published a survey, and they've published one every year. There was one in 2022. And uh, if, you're real, if you're interested in threat hunting and seeing kind of where it evolved from um, and what companies say they were struggling with, whether it was skills, skills gaps, um, technology gaps, things like that, um, definitely check those out. And speaking of um, highly valuable resources, uh, 2018, so 2017 SANS survey found one of the major complaints for, for threat hunting, people trying to implement threat hunting or even not understand what threat hunting was, was there, there was no methodology that um, people could like a repeatable methodology published. So there were some folks and some smart folks in the Dutch financial sector uh, created this thing called Tahiti. It stands for Targeted Hunting Integrating Threat Intelligence. And uh, we'll look at that a little bit. We'll, like I said, we're gonna have to skip over that deep dive into it, but definitely check it out. It's very easy to follow and uh, I recommend reading it, reading it again, reading it again. And then one of the major milestones that I think, I blogged about it, but um, in 2020, NIST added threat hunting as an actual control, uh, which kind of validates, that, you know, to me anyway, that it's something that people should um, maybe take seriously. So what is it? Um, threat hunting is uh, detection engineering at its core, right? It's trying to figure out um, what gaps in your security exist and then coming up with the data and the processes that you would need in order to determine or in order to see if that is happening on your network, right? The difference between um, security monitoring and threat hunting is security monitoring is really point forward. Threat hunting is really um, looking backwards, present and backwards, right? So that's how those things kind of differentiate from each other. Some other meaningful ways that threat hunting kind of distinguishes itself in the security operations disciplines. Um, it's proactive versus where IR is reactive, right? You're not waiting for a light. You're proactively going out and trying to find how might a threat actor be trying to attack my network? Would I be able to see it? If not, let me go look, find a way to find it, and then uh, recommend new detections for it. It's an assumed breach position. So that means that 
the email attachment has been clicked on and something's been executed, something's been downloaded, it's assumed breach, right? So, so this goes kind of in parallel with something we'll talk about called the threat hunter's mindset, which is it's not a matter of, if you think about incident response, like the, the way that incident response is poised is, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, you better be prepared. Um, threat hunting is, it's not a matter of if, it did happen and you missed it, right? So you assume that there's a breach and there could have been one of a hundred ways, right? So in information security, we always say that uh, the good guys, uh, the bad guys only have to attack one weakness, the good guys have to monitor a million of them, right? So there's a million gaps that somebody might be taking advantage of in your network. This kind of helps you put you in that mindset. Um, you gotta go look as many places as quickly as possible. It's hypothesis driven. You're not just blindly going out and looking for oddities and data, right? You're, you're um, taking what you know that you're of the uh, combination of actors, actions, and assets, right? What assets do you have? What are the actor, bad actors doing? Um, and um, what are the actions the bad actors are doing and which of your assets might be vulnerable to those actions, right? Um, don't just, you're not just blindly looking through data. And then it's time-based, which kind of pairs with that assumed breach mentality. You've got a limited amount of time. You need to really um, look through as many things as, as quickly as possible. So make sure there, that you're um, prioritizing what to look for where. Um, it's not pen testing, although pen testing results can be used to tri as triggers, we'll see, for threat hunting. Because if your pen testers did it, your ed teamers did it, there's a likelihood that other people have been able to accomplish it as well, right? Um, searching for indicators of compromise. Indicators of compromise is that lowest layer. Atomic indicators of compromise, lowest layer of the pyramid of pain. It doesn't do good enough. It doesn't do a good enough job to stop the adversary. Plus, we can just take a list of indicators of compromise, feed it to an automated search, and just shoot out the results. There's really no extra effort required in there. It's not security monitoring because it's point forward. Um, it's not incident response because there's no blinky light. It's uh, not simply running a query in a tool. Again, if it was, we wouldn't. Uh, it wouldn't need its own discipline. And uh, it's not a, a process with guaranteed results. Now, it's not what they what they mean. And this is directly from Tahiti. But um, what they mean is it's not guaranteed to find a threat actor, right? But there will be results in things that you've learned. Things that you learned about your network will help you in the case of an actual incident, it'll help you know where you're, where to uh, go, what data you need, how to get them out. So you'll respond faster. Um, you'll create uh, uh, recommendations for new detections, for security recommendations to fix vulnerabilities, to um, create business policies, tighten, th tighten down the nuts here. So this is the threat hunting methodology. This is just the methodology kind of portion of it. The, the, the white paper has a, a ton of stuff in it. Um, we won't be able to go into this, but just know that there are three major phases of threat hunting and they're all, they all operate independently. The initiate phase is really, um, when you start threat hunting, you probably want to have a couple of people initially um, populating your backlog of the things that you're concerned that you might not be able to detect if someone were, were actually actively doing it on your network. But you'll want to grow that and open that up, create some mechanism for control uh, owners, network personnel, people who might know your network or the, we're not, none of us, we'll see this in a second, but none of us are as knowledgeable as all of us. There are things that people could be doing on your network that, cause, that you're not necessarily the most um, qualified to describe, help, have other people help you figure out um, how, how your network might be attacking. But anyway, the, the phase two is that iterative approach. That's that time-based thing. You go out, you, you, you figure out what it is that you take from your backlog an idea, hopefully in a prioritized manner. Agile is great for this. Jira is great for this. But you're going to add extra details. You're going to conduct some research. You're going to determine what data you're going to need, what an analytical technique you're going to do. You're going to execute it. You're going to look at the results. You're going to determine whether or not you're seeing what it is that you're expecting to see. If it's working the way you want it to, you're going to repeat it again within a time within a time range. And then finally, you make sure that you allocate time to document your results to share with um, to, to to share those recommendations with the rest of the company. 
This is just a regurgitation. I'll let you uh, look at those, but these are the, the, the triggers. What I will say is um, for security monitoring and the incomplete use cases section, there are two categories of in incomplete use cases as far as I'm concerned. One, uh, the incomplete use cases as it relates to coverage. So you might feel pretty confident that you can find Mimikatz usage on your um, workstations or you might find data exfiltration from your servers but not vice versa. So that's one type of incomplete use case is coverage. And then the other incomplete use case would be um, all of those alerts that your SIM came with that you turned off because they're too hot, they're too noisy, right? Um, those 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 do serve as they're they're. I know it sounds counterintuitive because there's a rule for it, but nobody's looking at it. It's just gathering data and telemetry. Group you might be able to uh, group multiple use cases, rules, alerts, uh, things like that together that might um, look at all in one. Um, sitting to to try to complete to if 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 you're trying to address a gap in coverage that's like data exfiltration, you might look at all of your rules that nobody ever looks at that have to do with data exfiltration. And then this is just um, what you do with your findings. Again, um, that that white paper does a good job, probably much better job than I'll do explaining it. So, um, what are we doing? We are at. Oh, the top lessons learned. All right, so I tried to get through that really quickly. What am I, I'm at like 15 minutes? It's still too too long. All right, so first lesson learned, ready, aim, fire. So I did a talk called Ready, Fire, Aim, why organizations struggle to find meaningful results in threat hunting, and it really comes down to this. If you don't understand your network, understand your gaps, and set out a goal, when you're done with your threat hunt, you're not going to know whether or not you hit the mark. You're not going to be able to provide management with your results. They're not going to provide you the funding anymore. They're going to lose interest. So make sure that um, you're properly determining in a prioritized manner what you're going to go hunt for and why, and so that you can actually tell, hey, at minimum, leadership, this is something that as a, as a operation we were concerned might be happening on our network here's my results you can be fairly confident that it's not happening right um, and then <clears throat> to be ready um, there is this misconception because in the chain threat hunting it goes prevent detect hunt prevent i'm gonna throw up a firewall detect or I'm going to throw up a firewall and I'm going to only allow outbound HTTP, outbound SSH, inbound whatever, right? Um, now I'm going to have to detect when someone is abusing HTTP, SSH, whatever. Um, but we know that companies with large budgets for security get breached every day. Um, and that's really, if we take it back to just brass tacks, it's because most vendors can really only supply you with indicators of compromise that can easily change. So this is why it's really um, important for you to be more proactive and customized to your network. But if you have data, uh, oh, and um, so people think that you should have prevent and detect perfect. That's not the case. In fact, um, what hunting does is it allows you to, you know, once you kind of have that initial setup of your prevention controls and your detection controls, if you start hunting, you're going to actually be improving your prevention and your detection controls. You're going to be finding your gaps. You're going to be addressing those. You're actually going to be improving detection uh, and prevention. Uh, but to, to, to be ready just means, do I have, generally speaking, data normally from applications, network, and in workstations because I'm going to have to pivot to prove things between those three kinds of three types of data, cloud included. Um, can I search? So minimum, can I search for IOCs? Now I said I know I said IOC wasn't hunting, but if you can't search for IOCs, you shouldn't be hunting. Um, and then IR because if you don't have an incident response plan on how you're going to deal with it, um, threat actors when you find them, the first one you find, you're going to have to actually you know that's you're going to have to stop what you're doing and create an IR. Um, plan. Time. Um, you, you have to have um, established with your leadership that this is going to take time. And it's not 
just the time to search data and parse data. It's also the, the time to prioritize that backlog. It's that time to go out and review the open source Intel and determine which ones you care about, which ones you don't. And then on the other hand, on the other end, it's that time it's going to take to document your results, share your results, things like that. The, the absolute death of a threat hunt is um, context switching. So you've had this data, you're looking at it, some things start to stand out to you, and then all of a sudden, boom, you have to go over and um, deal with somebody, some uh, hardware, software, infrastructure issue, incident, or some, some executives uh, saw something on the news they need to talk to you about, whatever. They can't pull you away in the middle of a hunt. Um, suppliers, SIPOC is suppliers, inputs, processes, outputs, and consumers. And what I really mean about this is understand who, because you shouldn't be deciding in isolation what you're going to go hunt for. You should really be understanding what the organization is worried about, right? So work with, determine who your suppliers are, and then work with them to help them a steady stream of input. That's kind of that backlog we were talking about earlier. Um, the process is the threat hunting, those three phases. Outputs um, were the, you know, sharing who you're going to share with. If you're going to be creating countermeasure requests, make sure that you understand what the process is and what those, what they expect from you in the, in the way of um, format. Is it, is it a JIRA ticket? Is it, you know, how do I, what, what information do you need from me um, in order for me to pass this off? That was a huge issue uh, when I was standing up threat hunting was I kept opening up tickets and they just fell to the bottom of the queue, right? So make, because I wasn't providing enough context uh, as an example. Get in a room, uh, at, you know, within the first few months of standing up the threat hunt, realized that we were working on, um, we were uh, doing uh, dual like effort. We were, uh, lots of people were working on the same problems in isolation. We weren't working together. So we got, and this is a large corporation, but your control owners as needed if you have separation between your incident responder and your intel, get them in the room, ask them what they're seeing, help kind of create that um, backlog of, of things that you need. I already talked about that misconception. Okay, so crawl, walk, run. We started, we, we thought we were pretty awesome. Um, we started looking at machine learning algorithms. We started looking at, you know, all these really advanced things um, from a threat any perspective, pulling out the really hard use cases like the run DLLs and, you know, uh, um, auto runs on every machine, AM cache, like all of these huge data sets. Um, first of all, we couldn't gather them um, at scale, but um, that was a huge mistake. What you really need to do is start off with that low-hanging fruit. IOCs is the lowest of the low-hanging fruit, but there are things that you can look for um, I'll show you a couple of use cases, but remote access tools is one of them, right? How many remote access tools? So if you if you gather a huge list of remote access tools, I'm kind of bearing the lead here, but and then go and look and see if you have OpenVNC and um, TeamViewer and a bunch of them. Um, there's a potential for lateral movement there, right? So just go and look at how many you have in, installed, and then if any of them look like they're malicious, right? What this does is allows you to focus as you're building threat hunting, you're going to be building the processes, the tools. You're going to be understanding who your suppliers are, what they're giving you, um, what your outputs are, who's consuming them, how they want them to be. Don't make it harder to do those things because those things are the most important in the beginning stages. Focus on really easy threat hunts first and work your way up. Make sure you have your processes established. Um, know, then go. This is probably one or two. One or There's a, probably one or two main things that made our program um, a lot more successful. And this is, this is like one of those keys. Know your existing coverage and then know what it'll look like if you find it. So we paired together a data analyst and a security analyst. And the data analyst was, their, their main objective was to investigate anything that looked odd and try to explain it, right? Security analysts who have looked at data in, at any, uh, for any length of time, they have a pretty good instinct on what is truly malicious versus what is not truly malicious. Well, the, um, but we noticed that we were spending, we, so we would estimate two days to conduct something and it was taking weeks and it wasn't finalizing. And what we found was that um, the, the, data, the data analysts didn't really understand what they were looking for. Um, and 
besides the other thing was time-based. We weren't time-basing our threat hunts. So time-basing our threat hunt and then having the security analyst and the data analyst sit down together and understand what is it going to look like if I find it, right? That, that sped us. I mean, that was a 100, 500% increase in our speed immediately. Context is certainly king. I kind of took that lesson forward with me at SecureWorks when we were developing the playbooks, threat hunting playbooks for our threat hunting service. And we actually put all of the existing rules first in the playbook so that they can, because we have, you know, a lot of customers that we do threat hunting for. Um, so what we do is by looking at the rules and looking at those rules that were related to the hunt that we're doing, we could see how, you know, things that popped up before, um, how were those things handled? Were those marked as benign? We can start to get to know the environment uh, more intimately, which is very important when it comes to threat hunting. Um, so we put the rules and the rule results related to the threat hunt at the top uh, for the service. The 30-30 rule, it's just kind of, um, it's just kind of helps you with that time base. So, and it also helps with that um, issue where the data analyst wanted to look further into it. Uh, the, the way it goes is, hey, I found something. Uh, I want to look further into it, but it has nothing to do with what I'm hunting for. Okay, can you, do you think reasonably you can figure out if that is uh, malicious or not? Because that's really what you're after is, is, um, is this malicious or not? Um, can you reasonably figure that out in 30 minutes? Sure. Okay, go ahead for 30 minutes. If after 30 minutes you haven't figured it out, it's time to put it on the backlog and continue with what you were doing in the first place. This also tremendously speeded up, sped up our uh, threat hunting our hunts. So, and then finally, it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but it's also kind of an extension, extension to the 30-30 rule is plan to fail, right? Um, what we were doing was when we were prioritizing our threat hunt use cases, and remember the threat hunt use case has the data you need and the analytic approach that you're going to try to take, try to solve it. Before we, during our prioritization process, we were saying if we don't have the data for it, then we lower, we lower the prioritization. What we were doing was inadvertently masking the need for the data. So what we moved to was go ahead, this is a high priority because we're genuinely concerned about it. So we started to do the hunt, and then if we couldn't get the data or the data was low quality, we would add a label to it, and then we would put it in a holding area. And after a while, you organically build a list of what is the most important data that I need in order to conduct, you know, in order to, to do my job. So don't, um, make sure you have a plan for when you encounter a roadblock, don't just mask the issues by not doing them to begin with. Um, 30, 28 minutes, okay, we're going much better than I thought we were. So hunting in a sock. No, all right. Um, where does threat hunting fit in a security operations? program. So uh, as I was filling out the RSA registration form this year, I noticed that RSA put it underneath threat intelligence. So it, I, it reminded me of a conversation that I had when I was first building a threat hunting program. My director asked me, which team does this most um, line, uh, align most with, right? Uh, the activities and the expertise and the skill sets. And he said, security uh, he said, uh, incident response or threat intelligence. And um, I kind of still go back and forth on that. There are reasons why incident responders make good threat hunters because they have gone through the exercise of quickly trying to identify whether something was malicious or not. Unfortunately, and I used to have the saying, um, the more you squeeze data, or the, uh, you, what is it? You can squeeze data until it conf it'll confess anything or something like that. Um, what they do is they, they have an incident that they're trying to, they're isolated on and they're spending a lot of cycles trying to, to prove that it's malicious or not. So they tend to focus a little heavily, a little bit too much on one individual thing. Um, threat intelligence people, they're, they have an understanding of what the most latest techniques, who the actors are, so they make a good, but they, they don't have the experience with the, with the actual um, investigation of the incidents of the, of the events of interest. But um, 
I did a survey on LinkedIn and uh, security operations came up the most. But if you go into the comments, what you'll see is most people say, yeah, it's all of those, right? Because if you think about it, threat hunting consumes threat intelligence to determine what, um, prior what, what to prioritize, what might be happening on the network and they don't know about it. Um, and then they feed incident response, right? Here's some things I found. Can you please help me determine if these are actually malicious and get rid of them? Um, but yeah, so it, like overwhelmingly it was all three of them, but um, it doesn't really matter where it goes. Uh, it, it, like some, a lot of times we'll see, we'll see that these activities, which is what these boxes are, they're activities, they're not necessarily teams. Sometimes we see that they're all the same person, if it's a small operation. Um, sometimes they're, you know, this half is one, this half is the other. Sometimes they're, they don't even have a threat intelligence. Um, sometimes they don't really do threat intelligence. Most companies consume threat intelligence, they don't necessarily produce it, but um, anyway, the important thing is that this is from a process from an operating model perspective, and we've kind of went over this several times, but um, threat intelligence is an evaluation of what are the threat actors, actions, assets, um, and then some ability to model whether or not that is something that you're concerned about and don't have coverage for within your network. And if you don't, um, generally speaking, indicators of compromise can go into alerts immediately, IP addresses, file hashes, things like that. For the harder problems where there's a lot of false positives, um, that goes into your threat hunting bucket. And what threat hunting is trying to do is to um, reduce the amount of false positives by applying logic um, and investigating, and applying more logic and investigating. So then, based on that, um, you can open incidents, you can um, create uh, monitoring rules, and you can feed back into intelligence. So that is where threat hunting fits in a security operations program. Um, I'll just kind of discuss briefly what SecureWorks has as far as offerings. Um, so this is so the team that I work for, I was or the team that I work on, the Counter Threat Unit. We're basically a research arm. Um, so one of the main reasons. For attracted, one of the main things that attracted me to SecureWorks was the amount of data that we had. Um, I can, I, I, we used to refer to it as like the network effect, but I can not only look at, when you're, when you're an individual company, you look at your own data and you find something and you have to determine if it's normal or not for your own data. I have the ability to look at um, data of a customer and then if I see a pattern and I'm not sure if it's um, normal or not, I have the ability to open that up to even broader. And vice versa, if I find something malicious, I can immediately use it to scan every customer that we have, um, like immediately based off of my research. Um, but that's what I do. If, if I don't find anything in your environment and you're one of our customers, you won't even know I was there. You might be able to see it in your history, search, search history, um, but you won't even know I was there versus our actual um, professional services, which is a point in time. Generally, if you're, if you are, uh, if there's a merger, a uh, new CISO, one of your competitors or partners was breached by something and you're concerned about it, um, you'll do a, a professional service. And this comes in the form of what's called a threat hunting assessment. It's, it's kind of like a compromise assessment with the addition of um, a, a library of playbooks that my department, uh, my team kind of created and, and kind of coordination with the other departments. So one of those, and you'll see, is this remote access tool. One of our most, our, the favorite one is that people get a lot of good feedback on is that um, remote access, but it's, you know, looking for abuses of, of WMI. It's looking for abuses of um, a bunch of live off the land binary cert util, um, looking for decom, I mean, just, we just run a ton of playbooks in a limited amount of time, just kind of either give your CISO, a, your new CISO, a level of confidence or um, let you know that this is or isn't happening on your network, 
uh, this thing that you're concerned about because it happened to a partner or whatever, um, but it's limited in, in time, generally 30 to 30 days. Um, then this is, we have two subscription services. One is Manage XDR, one is Manage XDR Elite. Manage XDR Elite is the one that I helped design. Um, <clears throat> this is a annual contract um, where we will um, triage alerts that are coming in for you, help you understand which ones you need to pay attention to, which ones are not that you don't need to pay attention to necessarily, um, and perform threat hunts. The, the fundamental difference, and I'll show you the splash screen real quick, between these two is this one, um, you'll have a representative meet with you once every quarter. This one's once every two weeks. This one, they run one playbook per, <clears throat> one threat hunt per month for you. This one, they run up to four playbooks. This one is pretty standard library of playbooks. This one, you can negotiate um, some custom threat hunting with. Um, Oh, and these, this, the Manage XDR is high and critical, and Manage XDR Elite is all of the other noisy alerts as well. And then Threat Hunting Consulting, that's the workshop that um, I, I deliver to some customers who are trying to understand <clears throat> what they need to build their own threat hunting program and, um, you know, when, how, whether or not they should partner with somebody. Um, this is just that splash screen. You'll see the same things that I just said. MXDR, and then where they start to, to differentiate is um, every single day, if you're, a, if you're a managed XDR Elite customer, somebody is looking at the traffic on your network for things that might be malicious. Um, and then you get a meeting quarterly versus biweekly, and then there's some additional kind of um, you, you can uh, actually, this is from our website, and I put the link there, but if you have any questions, I'll be at the booth after. Um, okay, cool. I'm actually on time. Um, so some example hunts to get started. This one I've already kind of talked about. So it, over and over and over, we see threat actors using off-the-shelf um, remote access tools, and we have a list, our own list is you know, somewhere 30, 40, 50 different off, you know, things you can just download and start moving laterally across computers on somebody's network. So get that list. Um, they're not, it's not really difficult to find. You just Google uh, remote access tools. And then um, you can install them or you can look and see, um, look at their man pages or whatever and understand if they're calling home, what address are they calling home? Because commonly, uh, they'll change the name and potentially the hash of the remote access tool. So other ways to find them is, you know, do they call home for updates, check for updates, those kinds of things? Do they use specific ports? Um, what artifacts do they change? Do they create in the registry? Because even though they're changing the hash, a lot of times they're, they're too lazy to change the way it looks in the registry during an install. Um, and of course, you want to look for the binary and the hash name, and then look in your command line logs to see execution of those tools, the flags associated with those tools. Um, don't forget to do remote desktop. But really, what you're looking, what you're trying to do here, is reduce the noise uh, signal to noise ratio, so that if somebody is abusing uh, or abusing an off-the-shelf tool or uh, um, built-in tool like RDP, WinRM, WMI. If they're using those things, it's a much easier to see, right? So you're much less likely to be to fall victim to someone being able to use that. You'll know earlier because <clears throat> lateral movement. The reason why I like lateral movement too is because it's right in the middle of the kill chain. So um, and there's a limited way, a limited number of ways you can move from one computer to another across the network. So this is a this was this one's what I mean by the low hanging fruit. Um, type of a threat hunt. Um, the crown jewel analysis is a broad category. We saw it in the Tahiti kind of framework. This one is specifically DC sync because everybody always tries to go after your DC. Um, so just look at look at what domain controllers you would expect to be replicating. You know what are the, you have two or three or four or five whatever how many ever DCs you have what are their IP addresses they're generally static. 
those are the only ones you should expect to see trying to 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 communicate or trying to replicate with the other um, domain controllers. There's also network signatures you can look for for the replication. Um, but yeah, uh, then out of the output of that is recommend a rule in place that says if an IP address tries to do a DC replication that's not in this list, I want to know immediately. Wake up my administrator in the middle of the night. They need to know about it. And, and, and I, I had this one, and what it normally was was somebody stood up a domain controller, domain controller and they just didn't open up a service ticket for it. So, um, yeah, it also should encourage good behavior on your configuration management. Um, this one, we're seeing a ton of business email compromises. Um, I mean, one easy way to find those is look for inbox rules. So the same thing that you guys use to manage your inboxes today, right? Whenever you, whenever you set a inbox rule, it creates a, a log. Um, you can also use uh, PowerShell scripts, and I think, I can't remember if the AZ command line you can, but you can look at, don't forget that threat actors have a tendency to conduct an activity and then delete what they did to hide their tracks. So you wanna look at what's on your existing, like look at the running system, pull that data, and then you also want to look at the logs in case it's not on the running system anymore, it's only going to be in the logs. So check both places for all of these things that I'm talking. If there's, if there's a potential to find it from the running system as well as in the log, check both places during your threat hunt. But these are like the set transport that, that occurs on the Exchange Online server. Set mailbox is, is um, another kind of in, falls in the category of this. But the idea is that you are either, one thing that we're seeing commonly is um, they're setting up these new mailbox rules, but instead of forwarding the email to a malicious email address, they're forwarding it and staging it in a folder. So they'll let it run on, and they'll, the, your, your uh, rules will have keywords in them like invoice, right? So they wanna see the uh, invoices, numbers going back and forth, and they'll just, anything that might be financial information, um, routing numbers, and they'll just stage them in weird locations, mostly RSS uh, folders. <clears throat> and then they'll do one quick, set up one quick outbound before you have a chance to even know it's there. So don't just look for mail transport rules, or don't just look for mail forwarding rules to malicious domains or IP addresses or whatever, well, ma malicious emails. Look for it going into weird places in your system, on your folders, things like that. And also, recommend a policy. Um, make sure that nobody who doesn't own the mailbox, only a limited number of people who don't own the mailbox have the privilege to actually create those rules. Lolbass, Lolbins, if you're not familiar, there's a project, product, projects here, it has a ton of them, um, both Linux and Windows. But you can go through them one-on-one or one on one as part of your initial threat hunting activities to do that kind of low-hanging fruit, don't get too complicated too fast. Or you could, you could run a big query and look at all of them at once. But what you're looking for is, um, this starts to get a little bit more complicated. What you're looking for is weird parent-child relationships is, are these things running command? Are they running PowerShell? Are they supposed to do that? Um, the, uh, you'll have to, in many cases, you're gonna have to get rid of GUIDs, um, parse your, parse your um, actual data fields to, to be able to stack them and look for least frequency occurrence events. Um, and then, yeah, like for a lot of these, you, you can actually search whether or not it's for data exfiltration or not, and you can look at the ones that are for data exfiltration, and then you can start creating rules. Once you can identify a, <clears throat> so these things should only be, if these things are used for moving data, they should only really be used for moving data inside your network, so look for anything that's an IP address that's not your network or even not a standard RFC 1918. Um, this, I, this is um, Azure Key Vaults and Secrets. Uh, you have, this, this is a, the, the um, graphic is really kind of just displaying, and also with DC Sync, by the way, um, you do have to enable some specific logs. So what you'll do is you'll create this use case that says, hey, I think people are, are trying to steal secrets. Um, 
keys, things like that for my, my Azure Key Vault, or I think people are trying to um, sync, replicate with my domain controllers, and then you'll go to look and you'll, the data's not there, so you have to go turn on the logging, and that's where you put that blocker on until you can go back and, and fix it. But these are all the kind of um, operations that you'll be looking, who's doing it, how often is it done, um, this will help you try to prove or disprove that somebody's in your network trying to steal your secrets and keys. Um, I had the, the picture of the, the plug flashing people, but um, these are some of the very talented people that I work with in their blogs. Um, you'll find a lot of ideas for, um, mostly if you're, if you're concerned about cloud, um, but uh, Lena, Lena's very talented or, uh, incident responder. She has a ton of other stuff ideas for threat hunting uh, that you might be able to, to use. She, she First, she does a very good job of describing what the attack is, what it looks like, and then her recommendations on how you would um, lock it down so people couldn't do it or search for it to see if it actually happened. And that's it. And I actually did it in time. Any questions? How many uh, are actually in a security-related role within their company? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, if, uh, like I said, I, I strongly recommend threat hunting. And what that kind of might look like for, depending on the size of the company, a smaller company, you might just set up a day, a hack day, if you will. Um, Again, you could partner with an organization to help you kind of take a closer look at your network. Um, medium to larger organizations, you could do it. Um, like we had the, the, the professional services is more of an ad hoc, so you might do a threat hunt. Just if something happens um, and you're concerned, you see a pattern in your incidents over and over again, and you're concerned that somebody might be doing it um, in a way that isn't triggering alarms. Because if you think about from the from the left to right, like something was downloaded, something was clicked on, something was installed for persistence, a backdoor, something was uh, then laterally moved, and then maybe a remote connection was added, and then things were exfiltrated. So you might be, in your incidents, you might see, I'm catching this over and over again because they're, um, because I have a, a, they're downloading from uh, Gmail or um, Dropbox or whatever, um, so I'm catching it, but there might be aspects of that that were happening before you caught it that it didn't trigger until somebody downloaded something. What happened before that? And if you can find patterns in those incidents, you know, maybe you can, as, as a follow-on from the incident response, you can create threat hunts for those types of things. This is obviously an issue in your network. Sorry, I asked if any questions, and then I just kind of started talking again. All right, if you do have any questions, uh, I'm out in the booth. Thanks again.